and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This is your Reverend, Faith and Current Affairs. Welcome to this week's episode of Irreverend, Faith and Current Affairs. I'm Jamie Franklin. I'm very, very, very happy to be with you this day. And I'm joined by Thomas Pelham and Daniel French. We're all vicars in the Church of England. You may not know that by our clothes. You may be thinking, this chap's wearing a tie, this guy's wearing a hoodie, and this guy's had some kind of car accident and has a brace <laughs> around his neck. But no, we are actually vicars in the Church of England, believe Jamie, it or not. Jamie, um, are you um, are you wearing some sort of old boys tie? It looks like you should be. Is it like an old school tie? Or ah, Tom, I don't even want to. I don't even want to draw attention to it because it would, you know, why why would I do that? Hang on a second. Is this the tie you ought to graduate? No, no, it's no. it's my it's my it's my college tie. Um, it's your college, it's, tie, your it's, college it's, tie. Well, it's from St Anthony's College, Oxford. Yeah. 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 So yeah. somebody bought this for me as a gift, actually. So I wear oh, it sometimes to remind me of those good days. I mean, they weren't that good, and I never lived in Oxford, and I hardly ever went to the college. So you know, <laughs> so, you're very proud of it, nonetheless. I'm sure. <laughs> never, nevertheless, it, you're nevertheless it's special. Um, okay. Yeah, there I just thought are. I'd wear a tie just for you know, just for something different. I thought. Oh, I was wondering, have you become like a sort of super evangelical? I was wondering, you know, whether you're going to be tie and tie and suit. <laughs> this brown is like shoes. more uh, this Baptist. Yeah. Floppy Baptist. Bibles. What's that? Floppy Bible. Floppy Bible. Yeah, I've got a hardback Bible. It's rock solid. In case, in case you know somebody tries to mug me while I'm while I'm preaching the word, and then I can <laughs> strike them with the word. Uh, anyway, that's getting a bit violent. How's everyone? It's how's everyone violent. doing today? Go on. Yeah, it's, well, it's, Ash, it's Ash Wednesday, isn't it? Um, it is so Ash Wednesday it's, today. Uh, it's a day of obligation and fasting. I hope everyone who's listening has has had a lovely day of obligation and fasting on Ash Wednesday. We remember that we are but dust. Daniel, on the other hand, has been hit in the head by a baseball bat. Yes. No, no he's also been ashed. Um, so uh, I think it looks uh, like he's been poked. <laughs> it poked really hard by a blunt scaffolding metal, pole metal yeah. tool. It, I've got it was a... a lot worse than it was. To me. Um, we, we had a lovely Ash Wednesday service in Marlborough Church. Loads of people turned up. And my wife had, sat on the front and I thought I'd be very sort of liturgically fashionable and ask her to ash me as I can't really ash myself. Um, and um, she decided to go for it. So I had a huge cross on my forehead that started because there was a lot of oil in it. It started rubbing into my eye. So by the time of the Eucharist <laughs> prayer, I had some black running down my nose. And my, oh, my uh, goodness. <laughs> Sounds horrendous. Sounds like um, some kind of uh, Gnostic mystery cult, or <laughs> cult of death. Um, I do, I, we don't we don't mix it with oil. Is that is that a thing? I don't know. Uh, it just I think seems it's like... practical, isn't it? Because if you mix it with water, you you can. I d- I just it did, become just quite ashed, irritant. Just ashed it, sort of just um, just dry, dry ashing. Um, yeah. but the, maybe it's a more Anglo-Catholic thing to mix. Maybe. It. Maybe. Might be. It might be. We don't want to get into this dangerous territory. <laughs> yes. That could be another spin off episode. <laughs> <laughs> Just, what is the appropriate um, liquid to mix with ash? Uh, if, if, if at all. If at all, yeah. Um, what, is, what is a genuinely Anglican liquid to uh, combine with the ash on Ash Wednesday? That, that will be. Um, a special feature episode coming your way soon. I feel a um, work party coming on. I, yes, indeed, indeed. We'll have to have a separate meeting about that. Uh, no, that's good. Well, that's yeah, good. I'm not. I, last year we had sprinkling. We sprinkled the ash um, so that we, you know, so that we wouldn't be infected uh, by the ash. Uh, as far as I know, that was safe because nobody uh, became <laughs> infected. infected. Yep. So that was good. Although uh, people are not really as worried now uh, because there are serious things going on, which is a segue into uh, saying what we're going to be speaking about today, because we're going to be speaking largely about the events of the last week. Now, when we recorded last week, um, it was on Wednesday, and it was it's immediately prior to uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And so by the time the episode came out, I mean, I thought it was a brilliant episode, and there was also lots of funny stuff with Laura Dodsworth trying to make Tom feel uncomfortable by mentioning certain body parts. But we didn't, we didn't talk about the Ukraine situation at all. So we're going to talk about that quite a lot. And we're going to try and give a kind of spiritual and Christian perspective uh, on on what's going on. And also, I think just share, share a little bit about how we feel about it and, and what the kind of things that we've been thinking about uh, over the past week. Uh, but first, some notices, which I know everyone loves, 
And these are genuinely, genuinely good notices. I mean, really good. Don't turn off now because these notices are brilliant. So firstly, we are having, wait for it, drum roll, please. Tom, can you do a little drum roll as a musician? Very nice drum roll there. Very nice. Very convincing. Uh, we are having a live event, Irreverent, face to face. Now it's going to be in that London they've got now. Have you heard of this, this London place? They've got a place called London. We're having a live event in London on the 7th of May. Now, we haven't opened booking yet, you know, buying tickets, et cetera, but that will open soon. And places are quite limited. It's not massive. It's not going to be huge. It's going to be quite intimate. So watch this space. 7th of May, London. It's in the Spitalfields area, I can tell you. Very nice area. Do you guys know that area? Near uh, near Liverpool Street Station. It's, kind got, of... it's got the meat market there, isn't it? Near the Barbican. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's that big, um, what's that? Uh, Saint uh, Christchurch Spitalfields. It's a big, it's a big church. So it's just like built, I think, uh, for the Huguenots or something like. That. Now it's currently populated by um, HGB, but um, it's a nice, nice church. I've been there. Nice coffee shop down, down, down in the basement. But anyway, this event is going to be awesome. It's going to be great, and you know we want you to come. So mark that in your diary and be ready when the tickets go on sale. Snap them up because it's going to be like a a John Bon Jovi concert at the O2 Arena. They'll all be gone like that. So ignore the ticket touts. Ignore them. They're false. We're not. We're not accepting it's any on any... eBay. It's not us. You know, I, we're not accepting I, that. I, just as an aside, an yes. aside. Um, I remember very well for my 18th birthday. I went to watch a band called Blind Guardian, a heavy metal band that sing about Lord of the Rings, uh, play in uh, London in the Astoria. Uh, which has now been uh, levelled for the Crossrail. But I bought—I didn't have a ticket, and I just wandered up and I bought my ticket off someone in the queue, which was really lovely. And you know, I just sort of someone was I didn't buy it off a ticket tout. I'm not advocating that, that with the markup. I just but but the problem is that the um the sort of all the stuff to stop ticket touts has stopped that sort of spontaneity. Yeah, uh, it's very annoying because it was just literally I just got on a train, went to the Astoria, found a ticket on sale, someone who couldn't make it, and uh, and had a really good time. Yeah, well, that, I mean that that would make me feel quite stressed, though. To be fair, Tom, uh, but I do I do take your point. It's all about the spontaneity. It's all about the adventure and so on and so forth. Right? Uh, yeah. Go on. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone from life. Right, okay. Okay. Yeah. No, that's true. It's true. Unless, unless, uh, unless you know, it comes except back. for maybe at, at the irreverent live, where there'll be all sorts of spontaneity, oh, life affirming spontaneity all over the place. Yeah, it's it's definitely not the case that we haven't actually planned the event, but have just put the venue. So you know, <laughs> they, we've got seriously huge good plans. plans, big plans, huge, huge plans. This event's going to be awesome. It's going to be it's going to blow your mind. All right. Anyway, it's definitely happening on the 7th of May in London. Another thing. This is an interesting initiative, which is being started by Dick Dellingpole. And I'm not going to insult him by saying he's the brother of James Dellingpole, but he is. Um, he has started a little thing which he's calling the Thursday Circle. Now, if I was to try and summarize what this is, and I'll be sharing some more information about this. This is a group that has sort of spun off from Dick Dellingpole's third, hugely successful Third Wednesday initiative. Dick and some friends who I would say they're the kind of people who often listen to this podcast. So Christians, uh, people maybe go to church, maybe not, maybe people who are interested, but in some way, you know, they're, they're not quite, you know, just straightforward churchgoers. They've got um, questions and things they're struggling with and doubts and so, so on. These people uh, in, in Dick's locality, they get together in a room, uh, in a pub, sit at one table uh, every fourth Thursday, and they just have a conversation about matters of faith, spirituality, current affairs, and things like that. Anyway, the point is, Dick is hoping that other people will think, hey, this sounds like a really brilliant idea. We'd love to get together with some like-minded people and talk about spiritual issues, talk about Christian faith, talk about our struggles, and that sort of thing in a pub every fourth Thursday. So, this notice is basically to say that if you think that sounds like a good idea, and if you'd like to pioneer something like that, then get in touch with either Dick, I think he's available on Twitter quite freely, or send us an email at reverendpod at gmail.com. And we will, we're going to gauge interest and we're going to, we're going to do this. We're going to start some of these groups up so that All people right. can have places to discuss. Go on, Tom. I'm, I'm, I'm dead up for this. There's a lovely pub in Burwash. So four Thursdays. Burwash. There we go. That's our second chapter already. Second chapter of Four Thursdays, uh, Thursday Circle, it's also called. Daniel's going to do one as well. Look at him. I'm doing a whole Lent one. It's every Thursday in Lent, aside from the one when we're away 
um, and Jamie and I <coughs> away in Cambridge. I, That's the six, apart from the sixteenth. Um, I'm that's, that's a Wednesday, isn't it? Similar, yeah. I'm doing something similar. Thursdays in Lent, looking at um, all the sort of issues that we've been looking at. Um, I've called it uh, rather tongue in cheek, Doomsday for Lent. Nice. Uh, looking Love at it. You know, the, the the big sort of the undercovering issues, uh, um, using the, the old word apocalypse in its full sense. You know, truth, revelation, freedom, yeah. liberty, identity. Um, what the Christian, what the, what the gospel says, how the gospel speaks into those, how the gospel is uh, the, uh, the the one true alternative to uh, uh, tyranny. Amen. So that's going to be that's going to be seven thirty in Salcombe Church. Um, we did think about having it in a pub, but the problem at the moment is we've got a we've got. People have been meeting in the church on Thursdays for prayer and reflection. So we're just sort of segueing in from that. So nice if one. You're in the locality in Lent, cool. come to Salt. There you go. There you go. You're going to get hordes of people now, Daniel. They're yeah. going to be flooding in there. I'd love, love. Yeah, no. They will be there, I'm sure. Um, so go to Daniel's church if you'd like to in Salcombe or uh, Thursday evenings in Lent. And if you want to start a fourth Thursdays group, and you'd like us to be, and you'd like to connect with us, then get in touch. Eventually, I think what we're going to do is have a website similar to the third Wednesdays where there'll be a map. And if you want to go to one of these fourth Thursday things, then it's going to be available to you. I'm super excited about this initiative and I want to be really supportive of it. I think it's going to be really great. And I think it's going to scratch where people are itching. So fourth Thursdays, uh, give us an email if you're interested at all. We'll make some kind of list or something. I mean, it won't be me. It will be somebody with administrative ability doing that. But um, that would be good. All right, Daniel, do you want to do a plug for your new podcast, Catacomb FM? Yeah, uh, we've, uh, after a bit of a break, we did, I suppose the Christmas issue was a pilot one. That went really well. Uh, we were just behind, irreverent, actually, in the top of the pop charts of religious <laughs> podcasts. Um Brandon Latournier and I are doing uh, this pretty much every Saturday. So it's probably going out Saturday night, Sunday. What, we, Daniel, what you need to say what it is first. Yeah. <laughs> I got so overexcited. So <laughs> Hatkum FM is looking at um is looking at sort of deep issues of uh, of faith in this difficult age. So we're, we're drawing out issues. Um like, for instance, this coming Saturday, we're going to look at is is there such a thing as spiritual evil? And we're going to give that an hour or so of unpacking. We Our last episode that we've just put out looks at uh, Christian unity and how our lack of Christian unity has got us into the mess that we are in at the moment, even including and including, uh, you could say, the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, we touch a little bit of, upon Eastern Christianity, um, um, why there is this revival of interest in Eastern Christianity. But we'd love to know, uh, we'd love to know subjects that people would like us to look at. Um, Brandon's got a whole string of degrees and he's my uh, intern here from America. Uh, and um, yeah, so that that's nice. uh, a deep looking at, you- at, at various Christian subjects. Yeah. Can you do one on whether Jamie or I are correct? I think it needs to be well, I mean, that would be a very, life. very short, short episode. Catacomb um, uh, FM, uh, available on all, FM. on all major podcast platforms, I assume, yes, Daniel. Yes, yep, yep. Yeah, just go find it yep. right now um, because it will be awesome. Very all good. right, so that's that. Next thing, just finally to say, we're, on, we're all over social media, on Telegram, on Twitter. You can email us, like I just said. And if you'd like to support the show, which is something we really appreciate, please do go to patreon.com forward slash irreverent, helps us to cover our cost and it gives us really exciting options for the future as well. So if you like the show and if you want to support us, you can do so from as little as £1.50 per month. Plus VAT. Plus VAT. Plus VAT. In the UK, it's 20% £1.50, which is 40p. It's not very much. So if you'd like to support the show, you can do from that amount or you can give more if you like. But we do really, really appreciate that. It's really, really good and helpful for, for the podcast. So please do that. So uh, great. Those are all the notices. I'm not going to do any more. 
you know, that that was probably, you know, I mean, well, I was going to say that was probably not very interesting, but I, th- I think it's super interesting, all of that stuff. Uh, we're going to go to our Bible reading now. We're going to be reading from um, Revelation 4, 1 to 11, just so people know, if you haven't watched it or listened to it before, we just we just chat briefly about passage from scripture, and then we'll go into talking about um, uh, events in the world. So kind of scripture, a little bit of scripture, a little bit of talk about the news. And uh, that's basically what the show is. That's our idea. That's our USP. So here we go. Um, does somebody, can somebody read this so it's not I, me talking? I can, I can do it. Okay. Yeah. yeah, Revelation chapter four from the King James Version. Oh, here we go. Okay. Always. Epic, epic. <laughs> After this, I looked and behold, the door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment. And they had on their head crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts, full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had the face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts gave glory and honour and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth for ever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth for ever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Well, great reading, Tom. It's really nice. I was totally transported into the heavenly realm then. Um, right. Eyes. So, I, yes. Um, Eyes so, everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going mad then for a minute. Um, <laughs> Revelation 4, uh, verses 1 to 11. So we've just had all the churches, uh, the letters to the churches um, sent by Christ. And this is a vision that's given to John, the seer, immediately after that. those, uh, those letters. So... There's an open door in heaven, which Christ makes possible for John to go through. So it's not a very well constructed sentence, but you see what I mean. And he has a vision of heavenly worship, which is centered around the throne in heaven, a throne in heaven with God seated on the throne, presumably to judge and to rule. And I don't know about you, chaps, but I take this I take the theme of this uh, this chapter to be the church represented by the 24 elders. So you've got the 12 um you've got the 12 patriarchs of israel and you've got the 12 apostles so that represents that represents the church or you know if you like the people of god all the people of god and then you've got those four creatures with all those eyes which i take to represent all creation so it's a vision of the church the people of god the redeemed um redeemed humanity and all creation worshiping god in heaven so it's this kind of um, very elaborate scene with all sorts of imagery um, references back to the Old Testament as well. Those those four creatures are um, very clear, clearly references to the first chapter of Ezekiel, where Ezekiel has a has a vision which is not exactly the same, but has very similar elements. Um, I just want to point out some really interesting uh, imagery in this. So the uh, in verse three, for example, it talks about. The way that the one who sits on the throne, which we take to be God, had uh, had the appearance of Jasper. And I've got in my translation Carnelian. I can't remember what it was in the KJV. But it sardine was, stone. <laughs> sardine stone. <laughs> yeah. So so as I understand it, those so Jasper, as I understand it, is green and Carnelian or presumably sardine, if it's the same thing, is red. And then around the throne was a rainbow that looked like an emerald. And emeralds 
uh, again, I read this. I haven't actually looked up any photos, but I understand that emeralds are green as well. So there's this kind of maybe this imagery. I don't really know exactly what it means. I mean, I've read I've read Church Fathers speculating about it, but maybe green kind of means like the abundance of life and creation. Uh, red might refer to judgment. It might refer to blood or something like that. But it's interesting that the rainbow itself is is made of emerald. So that's green as well. So it has kind of um, connotations of creation. It also refers back to the 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 co- the covenant that God made with Noah when he placed a rainbow in the sky to show that he wasn't going to flood the earth again. So there's kind of there's something quite interesting there. Um, then you've got the elders, the 24 elders, so representing the patriarchs and the apostles, representing the people of God. They also are seated in on thrones, showing that they have authority. They're wearing white, which symbolizes purity, and that they're wearing crowns, which again symbolize, you know, authority or something like that. The actual scene itself is a contrast of thunder, chaos, you know, lightning, rumbling, all of that sort of stuff, but also with a stillness of a glassy sea in in front of in front of the throne. And then you've got the seven spirits who are the Holy, well, which represents, sorry, the Holy Spirit. And then you've got the creatures, which I think in, in one way or another represent uh, creation. One, um, of course, what, it's, it's worth noting, sorry, Jamie, that seven, on, yeah, yeah. As, we, as we said before, seven is, is, a, is a number of completeness uh, in, in the sort of Jewish uh, Hebrew kind of world view. So those seven, uh, much like the seven churches or seven lampstands, uh, his seven spirits, it's a completeness. So it's not necessarily saying, uh, there are seven parts of the Holy Spirit, but it is saying, you know, the Holy Spirit is a complete thing. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So, yeah, so you've got that. Then you've got the four creatures and they all worship God. And then the, you know, my favorite verse in this is is when it talks about uh, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, singing, worthy art thou. And that image of, of the the saints in heaven even the ones who are ruling in heaven in some sense, casting their crowns down before the throne is an image of the way, I suppose, that whatever sort of authority or power or gifts or abilities or status that we're given in this life, um, it's all subordinate. It's all to be submitted ultimately in worship to God. And there are, of course, um, those that imagery has been used in, in various hymns like... Um, holy, holy, um, holy is the big one. That's taken from this... Uh chapter throughout isn't it yeah well um, go on can you quote the can you quote the bit oh uh, well it's, it's pretty much a direct quotation but let me just uh, uh, cast uh, it's just, just casting yeah yeah all ho- the same casting, the, casting on. down there here we are um holy 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 lord god almighty is the hymn yeah um it's yep. just just opening now hymnody.org great site <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh where is it um yeah, yeah, holy, I, holy, holy, all the saints adore thee, casting down their cold golden crowns around the glassy sea, cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee, which were and art and evermore shall be. Yeah, there we are. So that's lovely great, one. Great also, um, love divine, all, all loves excelling. The final verse of that change from glory into glory till in heaven we take our place, till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love and praise. Mm beautiful beautiful um lyrics one of my favorite hymns i think um let the mortal flesh keep silent as well you, go on daniel uh that has lots of references to this does it mention the the crowns as well in that one uh no not so much the crowns but the angelic the angelic yeah the kind of the scene of heavenly heaven. worship Friends. yeah and of course in in more sort of high church and and certainly in eastern orthodoxy the idea of sort of the church as as um a scene of heavenly worship is is a sort of a controlling motif, isn't it? That it's a kind of recreation of these sort of scenes in in um, in the Book of Revelation, you know, colours and and smoke and you know whatever else, music and worship and all that kind of stuff. So I guess um, I, guess, I guess for the, just to sort of uh, you know push the kind of you know uh, that that's a spiritual thing in as well. It's kind of all the colour needs to be in, inside you. Uh, yeah. Worship the Lord, casting down all these things in front of him inside a whitewashed room as well. But yes. <laughs> Trust you, Tom. Oh, there's a your, spin-off coming. <laughs> your Protestantizing, your Protestantizing yeah. interpretation. No, I, wasn't, I, I wasn't making a value judgment. I was just I was just yeah, stating yeah, it. Yeah, I was right. just stating it as a matter um, of fact. But, uh, but also, um, but there is that I mean, I'm reminded of St. Barnabas in Oxford, um, where both yeah. you and I spent some time in Oxford, didn't we? Yeah, uh, great Jamie place. And, great uh, place. Just the, the enormous uh 
sort of dome of Christ triumphant uh, sort of above the altar. You know, so it's very, it's very beautiful. So yeah. It does, does, your soul does leap heavenward. Yes. Um, I find this and of a much of um, the book of revelation interesting and contrasting to um, churches that are more worldly and secular um, who buy into the sort of progressive narrative. Uh, I, I think must have real problems with something like chapter four, uh, because here is a reading that is very you know, apocalyptic. It, it's mystical, supernatural, uh, all the things which, you know, that there will be some theologians will say, oh, this is all a bit pre-modern. It's, yeah. pr- it's probably patriarchal, Daniel. There we are, patriarchal. Yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll, I mean, if, just if, write it all off as patriarchal. It's all right, you know. Yeah, <laughs> and and it's got it's got a very kind of patriarchal view of kingship, hasn't it? Because it's like you know yeah. a man on a throne with people worshiping him and that kind of stuff. Go on, yeah. Daniel. No, no I, I just think uh, to me it, it also highlights the the danger of ignoring the apocalyptic, mystical, supernatural element of the Christian faith, uh, and. Um, and the French philosopher Girard, I think, talks about this sense of God throughout history having to strip back the church when it gets too worldly. And he says that even as a Roman Catholic theologian, that he sees the Reformation in that light, you know, of God constantly stripping us until we uh, we stand before the cross with nothing. Mm. Uh, that that is that is part and parcel of the church's vocation. Uh, as a as a family stretching two thousand years is to be open to this, and yet, in how many of our churches do have we ever heard a, a serious preaching of this? Yep. Mm. Uh, yep. We, we just buy into the um, the myth of progress, really. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. And well, it, I, think, <laughs> I think a lot of people find this embarrassing, um, and I, I think that's there's actually a deep shaming and lack of imagination and intellectual curiosity i i agree but I, yes and, and and this is a sort of microcosm of what should happen in all creation i mean i think jamie's right um about thinking it in those terms hang on uh, did you just say i was uh, right i, I do i do i'm just you're right. i'm just taking note of that and enjoying um, it go on carry because, on because because this is this is essentially what happens in all in all uh you know it should happen in all worship which is we receive from god and we give to God, and, and there's this, this sort of great, um, you know, the glory pouring down from from heaven, that we then, you know, give give back again. Um, yeah. uh, and I just I just love the idea that you know that there's this whole kind of um, this, this liturgy going on and on and on as as the as the four beasts worship and the angel uh, the, t- the elders worship and the, the glory is given to God and then God cascades glory back into creation. Um, I think uh, is is amazing. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was talking to someone the other day and he said to me, um, you know, he'd been praying the Lord's Prayer regularly. And when he gets to the bit at the end, you know, um, the, yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, whatever. I just said it in the horrible modern translation, but, you know, never mind. Um, at that point, it's like you're saying, you know, it's not about me. It's about you. You know, I'm submitting myself to you. You are the ultimate object of glory and worship and honor in the universe. And I'm a part of the, I'm a part of the universe. I'm a part of the creation that worships you. And that's, that's the proper order of things. I heard an apocryphal story once, and I don't have a source for this apart from that. Somebody just told me it, Um, but apparently somebody asked queen Elizabeth II what she would do if Christ returns uh, while she was still alive, you know, Christ returned to the earth while she was still alive and she said, I would bow down before him and cast my crown at his feet. And I think it's a lovely image. I mean, I hope it's true. I mean, I really do. I'm sure really she would. I mean, she's, I'm sure she she's would. a faithful yeah. Christian. Yeah. yeah. But, but I mean, whether, whether she had the presence of mind to say that in the moment, though, Tom, you know. Yeah. That's the thing. Like she, I'm, I'm sure she did. But of course, it's, I'm going to say it's it to wonderful... fact. Good. Go on. Good. Go on. Uh, the, oh, wonder, the wonderful thing is that that, that kingship to, which she has is, is the uh, queen. Well, obviously, um, that majesty is is God given as well. So it's sort of, as I say, um, I think we spoke a little bit about this on Telegram. Um, why was I wearing a crown back before Christmas? And the answer being that we that we that we receive crowns from God, and then uh, because we receive them as as we become sons of God, not by um, 
the will of man nor blood, uh, but by the will of God. Um, but having received that 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 honor and and glory, we we then submit it. Uh, and it's again a microcosm is the Trinity as well, where, where you see that that love flowing from the Father into the Son, uh, and 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 being submitted back again, uh, and that happening um, uh, sort of constantly. Um, Mm-hmm. Yeah, sort of mutual submission, self, self-giving, self uh, worship of the other, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, I think this is a really, um, in some ways, I think it's a really helpful segue in talking about the situation um, with uh, Russia, Ukraine, because really, I think it gets our perspective correct when we read a chapter like this that regardless of who we are or regardless of who we support or what our political status is or something like that, there should be rightly um, always one who is above all, which is which is God himself. And unfortunately, a lot of the time as human beings, we forget that. And I think a lot of the time that is the origin and source of of conflicts because people have ideas about sovereignty and power, uh, which are not properly speaking, submitted to God and certainly aren't properly submitted um, to the teaching and the example of his son, Jesus Christ. Um, So we'll go into talking about the political situation specifically, I think, in a minute. And as I say, we're going to try and sort of, you know, not just reproduce sort of political commentary, but talk about it in a, you know, from a spiritual and from a Christian perspective. But just to say, I think sort of more abstractly, something that for me is is not something that in, is entirely resolved in my mind and you know i'll be quite honest about that is i i'm not really sure um whether i consider myself to be somebody who believes in some version of just war from a christian perspective or um or that I, i'm convinced by somebody like john howard yoda who wrote a book called the politics of jesus where he argues that um to be a disciple of christ basically precludes you from being involved in any violent action because it's so radically opposed to the teachings of Jesus. So that would be more of a pacifist take, which would say that the church is actually a new society, um, separated, but still intermingled with, you know, the old, the old um, political order. And, but the church is governed by the way of the cross and the teachings of Christ, which, which is clearly not about killing people and about, you know, taking people over and exerting that kind of force and power over them. But it's about sacrificial and, and, and suffering love. And we're called to love our enemies, basically, not kill them. Um, so that would be a kind of, you know, very, very simplified version of something like um, that John Howard Yoda would say. And if you're interested to read about that, you can find The Politics of Jesus. It's a very, very good book and uh, widely available. The Just War Take, and this is something, you know, I don't, I don't know as much about this, but would say that somebody like nigel bigger who wrote a book um again I, I think widely we, available we, go on tom i think we can go a bit further back than than, than bigger i think you know it's, it's got it's got its roots right the way back into aquinas and even augustine uh yeah. sort of it's, it's not it's not a new doctrine um but uh no not but yeah, at all yeah. and uh, um, biggest biggest uh, work um gives a historical perspective on it as well um but it's, it's just a quite i think probably quite a good book to recommend you know people are interested to learn about Um, just war theory Um, and that would say that there are circumstances in which the defense of the vulnerable is an act of love and that you can carry out carry out that defense in a way which you know for example um, minimizes collateral damage doesn't involve civilians and so on and so forth and that actually in fact to not protect people using the power that you have would be to to not to not love them because you'd essentially be giving them up giving them over to, to death and destruction and, you know, so from my perspective, I, I've got to say, I've not really resolved this in my my mind. I think that there are I think that there are things to be said on, on both sides. Um, but it is it is a conundrum for as far as I can tell, for a follower of Christ, that really what you want to say is that violence is evil and wrong. And that um, as, as followers of Christ, it's never the right thing to use violence in order to um, control somebody else or hurt somebody else. But at the same time, you know, what if there are what if there are circumstances in which the only thing you can do is use force in order to protect the vulnerable and the innocent? Um, so that's where I am. I don't know what you chaps think about that. I, I think the, the the essential thing for the church in this issue and for theologians and clergy is we have to be 
uh, nuanced. Um, because if we are, you know, who on earth will be? We, yeah. we have to keep that to that, to that. Um, I mean, wasn't that one of the great things during the Second World War that George Bell, the Bishop of Chichester, yeah. was particularly known for uh, and outspoken on? Um, I think he, I think he opposed the bombing of Dresden, didn't he? He was outspoken. I'm not sure, to be honest. I know he was he was deeply involved with Bonhoeffer, wasn't he? Oh, oh, yes, and um, that that nuance. I think the church has a ministry around there to to keep that that conversation. I know Anglicans speak, isn't it? It's all about um, difficult, was it difficult conversations or good disagreements and all of that. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, that, but this is it really in action, isn't it? When it comes down to conflict and war, um, this is where I suppose that's that um, uh, type of practice can actually have. Um, can bear good fruit. Uh, I, I suppose I'm personally, I, I, I've been very uh, fortunate that I was brought up by grandparents and my God, my, my grandfather and his brother both fought in the Second World War. So I had it firsthand in a way that a lot of my generations got it secondhand. Yeah. Uh, and um, so I was brought up with those stood, but it was interesting. It was never glorified. And actually in the last week before my grandfather passed away, he confided me in a whole load of stuff about the horrors of D-Day mm. uh, and seeing friends blown to bits. And uh, I think his brother actually edged more towards being a pacifist by the end of, um, by the end of the war. Um, and, um, my, my grandfather, I would, he, he, ne- he was not a pacifist, but he would say to me over and over again, you know, there's no glory in this. Yeah. And when you watch the movies and the films, it's a fraction of the horror of what it is. And he told me, I mean, he, I was the only person he ever confided in this. He said, I, I've you know, had nightmares ever since. Why should an 18 year old see something as horrible as this? I suppose it's what we call PTSD nowadays. Mm. Uh, and um, he had a very complex and nuanced view of where things were. We would have, we, we'd have some right old arguments about it. I can remember once, I wasn't really into CND in any great way, but I drew a CND symbol on in that bedroom, just partly to wind him up. You know, we, mm. we ended up having uh, a very complex discussion about that. Mm. Campaign for uh, nuclear disarmament, that is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I feel a bit, I feel privileged to have had that experience from someone who's been, who was there at the, at the front, you know, um, uh, there's no glory in war. Yep. Yep. And I think, I think that's the key, isn't it? Um, one can, one can make the decision as a country that there are things that are worth committing military force to protect. Um, and I think there have been wars in the past where that, that is, there are obvious ones. <laughs> Uh, but there are also, you know, there has to be a point to it, doesn't there? There has to be, it has to be achievable. Um, uh, and, um, and, I, and I think, I think my problem with this, this particular war is that, is that we, we, we're very much um, kind of neither of the pacifist take nor the just war take really speak to it very well. I mean, it's obvious to me that, that Putin shouldn't have, invaded the Ukraine, um, Ukraine. It, there's no justice behind that. There's no, just because he has the ability to doesn't give him the right to. Uh, but at the same time, it's not obvious to me that the Ukraine should be resisting because I'm not certain they will ever be able to resist in, in any truthful, truthfully the, the might of Russia in, in any um, sort of uh, in any, any enough to um, delay for long enough for example that sanctions might bite deep enough to stop the stop the effort i don't think they could do that i think russia is simply that much more powerful and, and it's not good it's not like the west can step in so you tom know, just but, before we get into the details but, of this but, no, I'm just, but what i'm saying is that, that we end up then in a position where where we're neither at a just war position that doesn't really help us because we might say well it might be just for the ukrainians to to fight because they're being oppressed uh, but at the same time, they're not achieving anything. So therefore, is it really 
is it minimizing collateral damage or is it or is it just extending collateral damage at the same time what well, i can't say to a ukrainian you need to be a pacifist and roll over because i wouldn't do the same necessarily if it was someone invading the uk so i, I you know i i'm not certain that it's very easy to to look at these things with anything other than than horror um but at the same time you know there's there's no easy answer is it, is it was it comes down to you know whatever your whatever your preconditioning about war is it's never an easy answer yeah um, yeah so i mean yeah i mean i guess that sort of opens the way for us to talk about you know what's been happening specifically in in you know the the russian invasion of ukraine i think we 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 ought to say at the beginning that obviously you know, we're talking in abstract terms just now, and we might be a little bit more specific in a minute. But obviously, I mean, just, you know, point one in terms of a spiritual and Christian response is that we should have compassion towards everybody who is suffering as a result of what's going on, regardless of your take on, you know, who is right and who is wrong. Um, we must, as, as, as Christians, have compassion, pray for people who are injured pray for pray for those people who are in danger and i would say as well pray for peace um there's i think it's something which unambiguously all christians um should agree on um you know just just point one before we say before we say anything else so you know our prayers are obviously with the people in ukraine also with with russians and um people who are russian who are involved as well in the war we should pray for peace we should pray for their safety um, and we should pray for an end to to the violence. So that I think is a really really important thing to say. I want to say something at the beginning as well, which is that um, when we when we talked about this briefly, I don't know whether you remember Tom. It was when we did that uh, episode uh, a few weeks ago. It may have been a month ago actually. But we were recording in the evening. There were loads of other things going on, and we just spoke about this for five minutes. I really didn't believe that this was going to happen. So I was too. I just put my hands up and say I was far too dismissive of this issue. Uh, I thought it was just, you know, mind games, propaganda uh, from the mainstream media. And um, I also made a comment about how, um, uh, well, implied that Russia was um, a spent force in terms of its economy and military. And um, at least militarily, it appears that's that's certainly not the case. Um, you know, they they mean business. And according to David Starkey, they've got a five hundred billion dollar war chest as well. So um, I spoke about something I didn't really know very much about in a way which was too dismissive. And I just want to sort of hold my hands up and say that um, that I did that. And, uh, you know, I'm obviously trying to inform myself now that this has become uh, such a such a massive story. Um uh, so some helpful links, which I'll put in the show notes, things that I've really helped me are um, the there's been a really good uh, trigonometry interview with one of the hosts, Konstantin Kissin, uh, which is called The Truth About the War in the Ukraine. And it's, it's, a, it's a really important point that he makes. I mean, he makes loads of really good points. But one of them is that as you know, from his perspective as a Russian with with family members in Ukraine. Um, his wife's Ukrainian, isn't it? Yeah, moment. his wife is Ukrainian as well. But he's hearing a lot of commentary from a lot of people who really just don't have a clue what they're talking about. And, you know, that, you know, one of the things he reflects is that, you know, he doesn't want to talk about stuff in public that he doesn't properly understand because he sees he sees the the, the error that's being made um, by people uh, who are commenting on this when they really don't know anything about Eastern Europe. They don't know they can't locate um, Ukraine on a map and they've never really done any had any sort of pre-existing knowledge of this situation so i just want to say i mean I, w- I wasn't completely ignorant but i didn't know very much and i'm taking that on board and it's just you know it's just something i think for anyone who's doing anything in public commenting on on um current affairs it's just good to be aware uh that you know we we should always be really really well informed before we speak about things so that's just my that's just something i want to say at the beginning i don't know whether you guys want to jump in on any of that okay. Coming in with humility is is always, I think, the first step to wisdom, isn't it? And um, the, the great danger, as you've pointed out, particularly with war uh, and where this could go and the dangers of misinformation going crazy at this point, um, actually having the humility to put our hands up throughout this and say, well, I think I got this bit wrong. Um, And I'm going to dig deeper and find out more, you know, and ask people who do actually know what's happening 
uh, or uh, have experience or live there. Or that, 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 that is, uh, I think, a good starting point. You know, mm -hmm. so, so much of um, journalism, unfortunately, today is people sitting on their laptops writing opinion pieces mm. uh, and... Um, I, I think we I need to go further than that with this because because the, the the price of getting this wrong and inflaming the inflaming the situation further um, this almost needs a deep psychological it needs a sort of Jordan Peterson psychological exercise all the time to be thinking to understanding what each side is what are their motives uh, and that for me is a way forward. Um, I I do think though that there's the, the slight uh, part of me slightly wants to push back, Jamie, against what you said because um, we sort of start <coughs> with um, a set of preconceived ideas, um, and when we are sort of being rapidly exposed to information, they they help us slot that information into mm. perspective, and so so. And so you end up with an opinion uh, and a sort of uh, a, a position where you already start. And there's a certain risk. There's a, definitely a risk of, confor of, of con confirming your own biases if you're not careful. But we can never understand the situation. And wisdom would say that, you, you know, in a sense, it, you know, the, the more... The more you try and understand the situation, the less you can know about it, and the more you realise you don't understand it. And if you went down that route, we would be able to, all we could do is sit, you know, sit around in silence and not say much because you never have it all enough information to make a truly valid um, sort of uh, judgment. Um, and so there's there's a sort of corollary to that, isn't there? Because otherwise you end up down the I think dangerous. Uh, line of the sort of check your privilege idea which has thankfully disappeared a little bit but the I mean, idea that that, that is not i don't i don't really see how that i know i know i'm saying but, it, but it i was is just saying it's because all, all i was saying is that you've got to be informed about something before you speak yeah, about it but the, that what I mean, i'm saying is that is that is that to a degree yes but you can still you know you can never be truly informed about something in a, in a properly you know you always have to have that proper humiliation you'd end up in a situation where the only people who could ever say anything about anything were the people who'd lived that experience themselves which is what which is what the sort of check your privilege thing is about and that, i think that's wrong i think you yeah. can have you can draw wisdom from knowledge that lies outside the immediate sphere and and apply it basically yeah well that's um, that's all we can do in, in this situation and i certainly wasn't advocating anything anything like that i know, I know. i'm not so, saying you were I'm so i mean saying. to give an example i think just to time what, what you've just said so I realised that the reason I didn't believe this was going to happen is because now I've got an almost total distrust of the corporate media. And now, I, because I think of what's happened over the last couple of years, um, you know, with COVID, I now think that if the media is saying something, particularly if it's saying something in a kind of homogenous voice, you know, in, in, univocally, then it's, it's probably a lie. And I think that, that was behind my reaction to it. I thought, well, the media is all saying this. They obviously want us to think about this and to believe this. There's probably some ulterior motive behind it. And therefore, I'm not going to believe it. And I mean, it's obviously happened. So I was I was wrong about that. And that, you know, that sort of epistemological prejudice caused me to make a mistake. Now, that's just a nuanced take. It doesn't mean that the media is therefore trustworthy because it's not. I don't believe the media is trustworthy, but it does mean that just because they're saying something, it doesn't necessarily mean it's false. And so for me, I need to I need to realise that, you know, if I'm going to engage with a source like the corporate media, I need to have a sufficient amount of nuance when I'm doing so. I, I'm not certain that the corporate media really did believe that this is going to happen, though, in as much as they, they reported troop buildups and they and they reported threats. But but the fact, you know, it's still quite a shock, I think, to most people even those who have been particular that actually happened, you know, that the, the Putin went, went, went there effectively. Um, and, and, I, and I think the reason I think this has happened is because you get, the, the, there was a shock. He's got so many articles saying along the lines of, you know, Putin's gone completely mad. Well, either, either there's something rational behind his actions and, uh, and therefore there was a threat um, or, you know, and so therefore you shouldn't be saying, oh, he's gone completely mad when he goes ahead and does what he's been threatening. Or um, or they didn't really believe him. They thought he was bluffing. 
and, and I suspect that was the case. They thought he was bluffing. Um, I suspect that's what, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, well, I mean, yeah. That's what, you know, I, I, I was, I, I suspected that. He, I thought he was bluffing. I thought it was mostly a, going to be a bluff, much like, um, you know, in previous um, uh, concentrations of troops, there have been a number over the years. But um, yeah, so I mean, this it leads to one of the major things I, I wanted to wanted to say about you know how how I'm responding to this. So obviously, as I say, I mean, you know, I just. I mean, I, I don't think it's I don't think it's necessarily the best conversation to like talk about like who's right and wrong or anything like that. Like I've said, I've got, uh, you know, I think we should have compassion on everyone who's involved and we should we should pray and hope for peace and and not not be insensitive to, to human suffering. But that being said, I do feel and I'd be interested to hear what you guys think about this. But I do feel a, a sense of discomfort over the kind of so one minute, you know, everything's normal except that we're still in the middle of a an ostensible pandemic right then russia invades ukraine and everywhere all over me all over corporate media all over social media we're being told that we should have ukrainian flags in our twitter bios we should light up our houses um blue and yellow uh, we should be sending aid to ukraine we should be volunteering to fight in the ukrainian army we should be having hundreds of thousands of ukrainian refugees come in our uh, come and live in our country. Um, we should be having days of prayer and fasting for Ukraine. Now, I, I'm not saying I'm not making a political judgment about this at all. I, but what I'm saying is I have a sense of discomfort over this because I feel like I'm being told what to care about, when to care about it, how to feel by this sort of overwhelming sense of force, which is coming to me, you know, through my computer screen, through my phone and, and so on and so forth so forth and it it it's just something that makes me feel very manipulated and something that i object to and i think it leads to us having an incredibly simplistic view of the world to engaging in in group think and you know in a negative way in a kind of mob mob mentality way of engaging with uh, political issues and it feels to me scarily like the situation 2 years ago with covid when you are basically told you must have this opinion. And if you have any kind of questions about it, or if there's any, you want to bring any nuance to it whatsoever, or if you're not, you know, you're not compared, you're not prepared to put like an NHS rainbow in your, in your uh, Facebook profile picture, that you're somehow some kind of, um, you're somehow some kind of irresponsible lunatic. And that's, that's what makes me feel uncomfortable about what's happened over the last, last week i don't know i don't know whether you you guys feel the same way that's just where i'm coming from about this issue i i i detect more than a whiff of propaganda happening on our uh, uh, on our on our mainstream news and indeed even on um some of the alternative news sites as well um, more than a whiff uh the, the things that i think are really discomforting to me are the complete lack of inclination to understand uh, Russia in this. Uh, I'm not saying agree with Russia. Understand does not mean agree with, but understand Russia. There's no sense in which, uh, you know, the narrative, and, and it's the problem I have with the archbishops straight up sort of, you know, this is evil. You know, we, you know, we must, um, it is evil, absolutely, but for someone like Welby, who 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 puts such a stock in um, in conflict resolution, uh, he must know that the place to start in conflict resolution is not you are evil uh, or your acts are evil, but rather to try and understand that there may be a narrative that they are working to that is not the same as ours. And I think this is the case here. There's a narrative. Uh, of, of the uh, of the Russians, whether you agree with it, and I, I don't agree with it. I think I think Putin is being uh, as being is is being wrong. He's wrong to invade. He's wrong to cause this suffering. Uh, but but I don't think he's doing so out of complete madness, which is you you, you know, or or because he's a second Hitler, uh, or because you know, uh, for, for, well I I, I suspect you know the 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 answer is um, that he has. Uh, decided that, that for whatever reason that this is the best way for him to defend in some ways the, the Russian country that he leads, you know, and that, and that is whether you agree with him or not. And I'd say, again, I don't, 
Um, that's got to be the starting point. Though. Why do they feel the way they feel? Why do they feel it's necessary to invade Ukraine? And why, why, and why is suddenly the, the press here, uh, why are they unable to ask those questions? So I mean, there's there's a really in, there's a really important issue there, uh, Tom. I think, which is about the spiritualization of of war, right? And I oh, was it's like uh, World War One again. Yeah, uh, it's awful, isn't it? Like there's this celebration. Oh, go and go, you know, go and join the the foreign brigade. Go to go to Ukraine and fight the Russians. And you think, well, well, come on now. More people piling into a fight is is not going to help the well, fight de-escalate. yeah as, i mean to be fair the archbishop of canterbury hasn't called for people to no, go he hasn't, um, just, but, just, but just to be just to be just to be entirely um accurate okay. but 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 i mean there is an interesting point there isn't it which is that five years ago we weren't allowed to want to leave the eu and now we've all got to be extreme nationalists um with regard to ukraine but just on this on this issue about spiritualization of war we've got this um statement from um justin welby and, and stephen cottrell the archbishops now i don't you know, as as a, as I say, I've got no problem with archbishops making statements about political issues, but it's in the language is interesting. So the horrific and unprovoked attack on Ukraine is an act of great evil. Uh, placing our trust in Jesus Christ, the Author of Peace, we pray for an urgent ceasefire and a withdrawal of uh, Russian forces. Um, so there's, I think, the thing that makes me feel uncomfortable about that is the way that it the way that it spiritualizes a political interpretation of the situation. So it might be the case, like you're saying, Tom, that um, the that, that Russians would not think that this attack is unprovoked, for example. It might be the case that um, it's perhaps not the best thing to do to, um, to say things like placing our trust in Jesus Christ in the same sentence as a call for a withdrawal of Russian forces. There's something about the too close association or the close association of you know a declaration of faith in christ with a with a demand that russia withdraw from ukraine which makes me feel uncomfortable it seems to me like a spiritualization of a of a war it's it's taking it's taking sides it's identifying good with the ukrainians and evil with with russians and all right that might be that might be the reality in a in a general sense i'm not saying it is but you might think that it is what I'm saying is, um, is it appropriate for any spiritual leaders when trying to give spiritual guidance to be saying things like that? Shouldn't we be saying things like, well, you know, we should pray for peace and we should have compassion on everybody who's involved, you know, Ukrainians and Russians. Russians are dying as well. You know, it might be that lots of these Russians don't want to be in Ukraine, you know, invading the Ukraine and, and, and being killed and being injured. Do you, do you see what I mean? It's, it seems to me that as spiritual leaders, and I would say as Christians in general, we shouldn't be taking sides in this kind of, you know, sort of spiritualizing fashion. I don't know if it makes sense. I, I'm, I'm discomforted because they, they were, they were, they've been, and they still, as far as I'm aware, completely unable to say anything equivalent about COVID. You know, um, and with, with you know, we've used such forthright language in the past about about the sort of the, the reduction of the the, the destruction and and, uh, and invalidation of, of human rights in this country over over the lockdowns, but they 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 aren't able to call out that evil um, for some reason. Yeah, but uh, even so, Tom, I don't think but, I'd say I don't think I'd have said you know, in the name of Jesus Christ, end the coronavirus act or something like that. There's something about that invocation about the name of Jesus Christ in a political conversation that just makes me feel uncomfortable, as I said. I mean, I, mean, I think it's, it's, it's a bit dangerously close to the World War One sort of rhetoric from the bishops then, you know, uh, go and go, go, go off and fight. And, uh, and that's another, you know, parallel, um, you know, this, this whole kind of pursuing war. And I think that did a lot of damage then um, just from a practical level, because, um, and I don't think the bishops have quite done that. Um, that but the no, press, no, the no, press no. is though. The press is, and and there's a sort of sense in which um, that jingoistic, uh, almost spiritualization of the war into good and evil, is 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 there in the press, um, even if it's not there from our archbishops. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I. I mean, I I, I thoroughly agree with, um, in, in, for example, that we should be praying for peace, um, and. Uh, I, I, but I, I just don't, I just don't, I just, 
I, I'm, I'm not certain uh, that I see quite so simply that they shouldn't invoke Christ, but I certainly think that the, the starting point of reconciliation, which they do call for, uh, if that's what um, international conference to secure long-term agreements for stability and lasting peace means, uh, doesn't start with your evil, and that and that I think is a bit of a disconjunction thing in the uh, in the in their statement. I think it certainly, in my mind, looks less like 1939-38, which a lot of people have uh, um, alluded to. Even having that attempted conference a couple of weeks ago in Munich, you know, and uh, then I think it looks more like 1914 if we're not careful. Yeah. Uh, where things can escalate and get out of control. Uh, and I suppose this is this is the this is the difficulty, isn't it, in terms of the the way that things can move very quickly in a hyper-digitalized age uh, with technology that our predecessors, military technology, for instance, that our predecessors could only have dreamt of. Uh, and um, that, that for me, I find particularly worrying and particularly worrying in this, in, in this discourse, that if we see it purely in 1939 language, and that, you know, you can see why people might see, see that. You can, you know, we watch the news, you watch what seems to be bombing of, clearly bombing of, uh, of residential flats, you know, and hospitals, nurseries, police stations. I mean, that is appalling. That you know, that that, that has all the whiff of war crimes in it and and uh, horrific aggression uh, that that is completely uncalled for. Must break all sorts of Geneva Conventions and what have you. Um, but my my big fear is. is escalation. And I, I suppose I, mean, uh, I was I was listening to Rebel Wisdom today. I think I'd recommend I've got a very good episode on looking at the Putin's religious mission, the Slavic mind, uh, and um, how two centuries uh, for Ukraine and for, well, Ukraine, I know, is a newly formed country, but still the people who've been in Ukraine and Russia uh, have been two really hard, they've had two really hard centuries. You know, and that, that has emboldened the Slavic mind to see things in a very kind of apocalyptic black and white manner. And it's all or nothing. There's very little middle ground in, in t- culturally. Yeah. One of, one of the Ukrainian periods was called the ruin, wasn't it? There's a historical period which is just called the ruin, which tells you everything you need to know. Yeah, and uh, if how we kind of participate with that, having ourselves come out of a very bleak two years, um, where uh, the the media to supposedly embolden us have have made the whole COVID thing seem very black and white and unnuanced. Yeah. Uh, to, to crash into another unnuanced situation with far more implications, you know. I mean, I think what has given me chills yesterday was the calls from, from various people, thankfully not our Prime Minister or the President of the United States or a no-fly zone. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 yeah, it, that, that, that to me would be so you'd have to be so sure about what you're doing and so sure about your opponent. Yeah, there's a recording of Vladimir Putin. Uh, I think it's in the autumn. Saying, you know, that, well, you know, if, if I have to press the button. Then. Um, I'll go to heaven. And we'll all, I'll be martyrs, and the rest of you will go to the other place. Now, <laughs> I think we have to be careful in how we. I'm sure he doesn't actually believe that. 
He said that in. I know. I'm, I'm sure he said it, but I mean, I, I mean, I, you know, whether or not he's genuine. So there's a very good, there's a very good um, interview with a guy who works for Christian Concern, who's a Russian guy, uh, which I, I think I've shared on our show notes. Yeah, Pavel Stroilov, yes. um, where he talks about the way that Putin, you know, he's a master of deception. He used to work for the KJB, and his job was to make himself appear as something that he's not. So. Um, you know, uh, he's sort of saying, you know, take his supposed Christianity with a grain of salt. You know, he said, um, this guy said, you know, um, obviously, you know, thou shalt not steal and, uh, you know, love your neighbor. Don't uh, don't apply in um, in the way that Putin is is um, carrying, you know, carrying on. Um, I think there's a really important thing you say here about the way that, you know, this this kind of media frenzy and the simplicity of all of this, the simplistic nature of it is really dangerous. There's a there's a good article in The Spectator called Tom. I, how do you pronounce his name? Tugent Hat and the, or Tugent Hat and the ru- worrying rise of Russophobia. And um, he uh, I can't remember the author of this, but he notes that this MP, Tom Tugent Hat, uh, said in the House of Commons that we can expel all Russian citizens from our country. And um, he writes uh, that this is a disturbing and unacceptable thing uh, for an MP to say that is reckless anti-Russian jingoism. I can hardly believe I can hardly believe that that was said by an MP in the House of Commons as a result of this. It's it's absolutely outrageous. And it just shows you how quickly how quickly when you have this, especially I think in an age of social media, things can turn really, really nasty and racist. You know, I mean, that that is basically racist, isn't it? I mean, no, we're no, meant to be no. hypersensitive about things like that. But then we're saying, oh, we should expel all the Russians from our country. I mean, what, what, what would that sound like if it said, oh, we should we should expel all the Jews or, some, or all the blacks? I mean, it's it's absolutely outrageous. No, Sorry, Daniel. No, I know I've, I've got an intern house, as you know, and there's an American, a Ukrainian and a Russian. Yeah, they all get on with each other really well. The best, yeah. of, best of friends, the millennials, uh, they're um, you know devout Anglicans. They're, they're on different Anglican churchmanships. Um, the Russian is is probably more a middle of road liberal Anglican. You know, uh, uh, horrified by what's happening, not supportive yeah. of Putin. Uh, How would it be if one of them? I mean, because he yeah. was Russian, was expelled from the country. As an MP is calling for that. It's, it's just extraordinary, you know. Yeah. And it, a, absolutely extraordinary. I, I, I find that most, most chilling and, and one-dimensional in thinking, really. Uh, MPs should know better than that. Yeah. I want to make a comment about um, Konstantin Kissin's interview because I think it's really interesting. I don't know whether did either of you guys catch this interview on trigonometry. Yeah. I mean, I thought this was really, really interesting. So, so his his main argument. So he says, so so a couple of things. Like you can listen to Putin's speeching speeches and see his motivation, right? So his motivation is he wants to annex Ukraine because Ukraine is not a real country and it's part of Russia. So he wants to take it back. But, and I'm simplifying here. Kissin says the reason it's been able to happen now is because the West is weak, because we've weakened ourselves, because we have forgotten what (coughs) our values are and we're not prepared to stand up for our values. This is also something that's said, by the way, by um, David Starkey in a brilliant video that he did about the history of Ukraine and now uh, Ukraine Western uh, relationships. But but I, I made an, uh, some notes on this because I thought it was re- really interesting. I think the first thing to say about this is that, um, that Kisin, I think, is absolutely right. We are, we are living in a time of absolute kind of ideological chaos. Not only do we not have any values, but um, to even talk about values is, is deemed to be kind of nationalistic or racist or in some way, you know, kind of dodgy, like some kind of hardcore uh, Tory or something like that. Um, so you're not even allowed to talk about values, right? But the, what I would say about this is that it's quite clear that Western values come from a Christian 
heritage. You know, I mean, it, it's it's just a historical fact. I mean, I'm, I've done a lot of academic work on this, but you can see this, you know, in the work of, of Charles Taylor, this book that I'm reading at the moment, Larry Seedentop, uh, Tom Holland's book, Dominion. There are loads of books which chart the rise of liberal values, you know, the importance of the individual, human rights, you know, equality. Um, the, all of these ideas come from a Christian foundation. And um, somebody even as far back as Friedrich Nietzsche predicted that when the West, uh, Western civilization moves away from um, Christianity, then the values that it's espoused can no longer hold. Right. So I think that that's what's happening now. I think that we have like ostensible values, but we don't really know how they fit fit together with each other. And we certainly can't kind of promote them. And um, we certainly aren't prepared to, to fight for them. Right. So so that's that's the first thing. Starkey says his argument is that power is still needed in the world. And we as a kind of globalist alliance have been pretending that it's not. So some shocking statistics here. So 80 percent of the UK tax budget is spent on old age pension, welfare and the NHS. 80 percent, 80 percent, 4 percent of the UK budget is spent on defence. And I've heard some crazy things about the German defense as well in terms of their underinvestment. Whereas, as I said earlier, Putin has a $500 billion war chest that he's been amassing for decades. Um, money and energy are needed for self-defense. We have been weakening ourselves by not investing in things like fracking and investing instead in green energy, which is expensive think, and inefficient. I think we're now dependent upon <laughs> Russian gas. Yeah, I think this is one of the key things, isn't it? I mean, I was reading a stat today that still paying Russia, even after the sanctions, one billion pounds a day in energy. Uh, one billion <laughs> is that, pounds. Is that true? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, billion I mean, pounds a day. Um, might have been a month, but I think it's a day because a month seems too little. Um, but they are supplying 30% of Europe's energy needs. Now, if we are to actually make sanctions bite, we need to prepare to be cold. Um, and even though, the, even if our, you know, even if our, um, you know, they have said that we only get 3% of our gas in the UK from Russia, that's forgetting the fact that we get a lot of our energy from Europe. And if Europe lost 30% of its energy, uh, we would have to be, uh, you know, we, we wouldn't be getting that. We're not energy self-sufficient anymore. We haven't been for years. So, um, so that's part of the issue, isn't it? I mean, we, you can, you can, um, for as long as we are completely reliant on Russia for our for, for energy stability, um, we, we can't do much that damages them. Well, I don't think we can. I don't think we can do anything, can we? I mean, this, well, we, we, this is the point that Kisin is making: is that because it's 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 linked to values, right? Because we have not because we've not valued our own culture, our own civilization. Because we're not we're not willing to to protect it. We're not willing to defend it. We're not willing to fight for it. We're doing all this stupid stuff, which has been weakening us. And now when somebody comes along and he says, well, I've got money, I've got power, I've got energy. And what I want to do is I want to expand the borders of my empire. We can do absolutely nothing. He's a man who's willing to stand up for what he wants to get. Now, I'm not saying that's right, obviously, but that's the, that's the fact. We are coming up face to face with reality now. Power is still needed in this world. And we've given all our power away because we because we don't have a soul. I mean, that's 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 Keeson's argument essentially. Go on, Daniel. Uh, just to sort of explore that a bit, maybe this throws a spanner in the works to some of that. What you've just said. I mean, I'm looking at Tom Holland's book here. Yeah. yeah. His last chapter on woke. Yeah. Um, now, I don't agree with woke. I don't think you do either. However, Tom sees it. Tom sees woke as uh, coming out of a Christian idea of sacrificial love and you know, the equality of human beings made in the image of God, that it has Christian origins. You might say, if you wanted to be pernicious, oh, it's a Christian heresy. Mm. Um, and likewise, you can see the same in the sense of um, internationalism, uh, uh, economic independence between nations, mm. That these come out of uh, a Christian idea of a you know a, uh, a sort of shared a shared commonwealth. Um, I suppose where, where I'm I'm struggling to see where we go forward with that is yes, 
there is the reality of power, but the Christian story also comes out of agape love. In fact, it says agape love and the love of enemies, which you started the podcast with, is, uh, is the significant motif of our religion. Yeah. Um, so this is like the arguments I used to have with my grandfather about my CND symbol. Yeah. That, you know, I'm not into CND. I don't particularly like CND, but I, at that point it was, it, it, it was more to provoke a conversation with him, you know, well, um, for the sake of power, is it worth losing everything? You know, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, and where do we go with that? And if we, if we become, there are ways in which, you know, we could, this could all change the narrative. We could all become much more nationalistic. We could abandon um, woke ideology and, and so on and so on. Um, but um, wouldn't the problem be in that that we could become, we could lose that, Christ, that the seeds of our Christianity in that, you know, we could become heartless nationalists, you yeah, know, yeah. czarists. We could end up becoming like the, the enemy that we're trying to oppose. Um, yeah, yeah well, that's I mean, where I'm trying to circle is, you yeah. know, because we began talking about loving of enemies. Uh, and what, when you say a weak West, what do, what's the alternative? Um, yeah, well, this is, this is Keith, this is Keeson's yeah. argument that I'm yeah. summarizing. I'm not necessarily saying I, no, I mean, just... agree with every aspect of it. I mean, but I mean, to, to, to come at it in a slightly Weasley way, if I were somebody who were, you know, taking somebody like Nigel Bigger's um, view that there that war is defensible in certain um, circumstances, you would say, well, you know, this is an unjust war that Putin is waging against um, another nation, and an act of an act of agape, an act of Christian love, truly would not be to have weakened ourselves to the point where we can't intervene and actually help anyone, but it would be to prepare for such instances and in them when they come about uh, to be able to step in and use force to protect the vulnerable now i'm not saying i'm necessarily um availed of that argument myself but i can set in situations like this i can certainly see i can certainly see where it's coming from i guess you know i suppose my sort of hope through all of this and you know obviously i don't want to i don't want in any way kind of relativize the suffering of the people who are involved in this war but my sort of hope is that it would be an opportunity for people to really wake up and to see the dream world that we have been living in, not just not just to do with green energy, but like and they, again, this is something that Keeson talks about um, extensively on the podcast, is that we've been distracted by things like identity politics, uh, transgender issues. You know, sh- can a man become a woman? Can a, can a woman become a man? Should a should a you know a transgender woman be allowed to uh, swim in the same event as biological women and so on and so forth is that we've been we've been living in a dream world and this is a kind of judgment on the west now again i'm not saying i think that's okay i'm not saying you know putin is you know the new cyrus or something like that but you know we have to be well we have to be open to the idea that the lord might be saying to us difficult things uh through situations like this i guess that's that's all i'm saying i'm not i'm not sort of suggesting that there is some kind of strategic point here to be made about a way out of the situation there is there is no way out of the situation go on tom you look like you want to say well, something yeah I was just, I was just, part of the problem is of course that the west has been doing both things hasn't it it's been talking up support for the ukraine i'm sorry ukraine i keep saying the ukraine it's not supposed to anymore are you um I believe that that is is wrong speak, Tom, and that you're not allowed to say it because it implies it's part of Russia. Um, (laughs) And uh, the um, but the the West has been talking up support for Ukraine and supporting its leaders in in the way they've been going, which is all very well, because I I actually do think that the West has values that are better than Russians. I'd much rather uh, Ukraine seek Western influence than Russian influence. I I would. But if you're going to do that, then you know you're going to antagonize Russia. You, you need to be able to support it. Now, let's be honest. Um, we've we've left them a little bit in the lurch. I mean, we're selling the weapons and we're putting we're putting, um, we're putting uh, 
um, sanctions on Russia, but we've already spoken how, how ineffective they are fundamentally because we're, we're reliant on Russia, but also the, um, you know, we cannot act in some of the ways that our politicians are talking about, like we cannot have a no-fly zone over the over Ukraine. It, it, it would it would be tantamount. In fact, it would be declaring war on Russia, and they would they would they would engage back. Um, we can't put our our ground forces in for the same reason. We cannot afford to to um, to escalate, and and not least because even even in even if we accept the wars can be just, escalating them is only going to lead to more misery than you know. In the end, and and that was, I was sort of trying to make that point earlier, you know the the the, the Ukraine forces are doing um, are, are fighting valiantly, and it sounds like they're they're inflicting a lot of damage on the Russian uh, forces um, in their defense of their home world. But but it's not it's not going to be enough uh, unless the unless sanctions bite really really quickly. Um, Russia has far too many people and far too much. You know, Putin is not going to allow himself to be humiliated in this way, which. I, and I, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong, and, and there'll be, you know, there'll be, there'll be some. Uh, Russia will withdraw and, and pull out, and, and um, you know, head between. But you can be sympathetic to a Ukrainian suit, you know. Yeah, I can be sympathetic. I can, like yeah. I said, yeah. as I said yeah. we'll go down fighting. Yeah, because absolutely. But where will our national identity go? I, I completely, I completely am sympathetic to that. But at the same time, I worry that. All this talk is is just, you know, I mean, people are already saying that they're starting to, the Russians are starting to level cities block by block in order to take them where there's been strong resistance, you know. I know. Um, and and if that is what is going to happen, then I, I think the the, the, the the sensible thing, the, the, the thing which leads to the least suffering of life is probably surrender and negotiations. Because we we are not at a point where we can we can save them we can't we can't go in there we can't liberate them we can't put our forces on the line on their own they don't have the resources of Russia. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, are gonna fight. I, I I just you know that's because just war says it has to be winnable. That's one of the things it says it has to be winnable. Otherwise, although it, they, the Ukrainians could point playing devil's advocate here, um, Tom could could point to Afghanistan and say, you know. I just, Afghanistan. We actually, Afghanistan was, was uh, so uh, such such a battle for twenty for twenty years. The Soviets tried to uh, um, gain complete control of that, and it it pretty much broke the back of the Soviet Union. You know? Yeah, and and so and so of the West for the last twenty years. I mean, I just don't think we're in a position where we can really be saying strategically what's possible for the no, Ukrainian no. military. In Ukraine, I, I I don't I don't really think I, that I, honestly no I think we can I think I think it's not it's not possible for the, U the Ukrainian ministry, military to resist Russia in so the long I do, term. I don't I don't really think that's you know it's not something that we know enough about is it we don't know anything no, we, about we do the we do if Russia if it's Russia not, have no we can if Russia ha have the will to continue <laughs> and Putin will not back down then then I do not think we can say that the Ukraine the, the Ukrainian military can hold off the Russians for, yeah for, I mean but they forever. could make. Like, I mean, there are, there are other instances, as I've just mentioned, uh, in they history could make, they, could, yeah, they, they could make it absolutely awful for Russia to hold Ukraine. That, that's a different question, but I don't think Russia are trying to hold Ukraine anyway. I think I think Russia Russia are looking for the the breakaway Russian majority ethnic um, areas to, to to be acknowledged as separate states and be subsumed back into Russia, or into Russia, one should say. And 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 have the Ukraine uh, a, a sort of not um, a, a free of Western influence eff effectively. Uh, I, I doubt they'll try and Putin would try and hold it for for any sort of length of time. But I, so, no, Tom, I, I think that's I think that's totally that's that's totally contrary to what Putin has said about Ukraine. Putin believes that Ukraine is part of Russia, and he's I, invading I think... Ukraine in order to uh, to take over Ukraine and annex it annex it to Russia. <laughs> I, I don't, that is I don't, what he said. I don't think we can trust what Putin has said as any more than we can trust anything else. Okay, but all right, Tom. I just don't think it's like necessarily the most productive thing to be speculating about the military situation on the grounds. Like we're not experts in that, are we? So, and and also it's another thing to say that you know Ukrainians should 
you know, essentially surrender to an invading power. That's up. It's well, up that, to that, them what they well, decide to do with their own country, isn't it? Well, it's like I if just, somebody actually, invaded just, our country and told you that you shouldn't fight them. You should just roll over and, and allow them to take over your country. But no, so Jamie, you can't say that and then also say that a pacifist take is is is, is, is a potential thing of Christianity. Because of course the pacifist take would say if they invade your country, just the the the, the, the roots of these suffering is not to fight it. No, and even, no, the well, even, even the just war take would say, actually a nuanced just war would say if it is un, unattainable, a defensive war, then you shouldn't fight it because all it does is causes more damage in the long run. But those are those are both within the the sort of theological constructs that we that we've tried to apply to this. Um, fighting fighting just to um, cause a few more deaths on the Russian side, and and in return have um, uh, city blocks levelled full of c- civilians, uh, in which uh, uh, and then and then to end up at the same point uh, is is pointless and bloody and and destructive and doesn't go anywhere. Um, okay, so I understand your point, but um, I don't think I don't think any of us are in a position to be saying what is um, feasible on the ground in Ukraine, or indeed morally, what sh- Ukrainians should be doing in response to an invasion well, of their I, homeland. I just I just don't I just don't think that's something that we're competent to comment on. As much as I understand your point, I, I disagree. But okay, okay, well that's good I, because uh, the, this this uh, show is. Uh, largely founded on dis- disagreements between you and I, and Daniel has taken a call, so he's not even he's not even here to comment on it um, to bring a little bit of of nuance. Mediation. Oh yeah, sorry. Oh, here he is back. Oh yeah, he's back again. Um, chaps, I think we should probably um, draw this conversation about uh, Russia, Ukraine to a close, and just finish with um, nice email of the week. Um, I think you know just to try and sort of come to a point of agreement on something at the end of it. I think we'd all say that. Um, we're not we're not uh, we're not comfortable with a kind of um, simplification of complex issues uh, that it's not right to be demonizing Russians, particularly whatever one thinks of the situation uh, with Putin, and that we should certainly pray for peace and uh, for the well-being and welfare of everyone who's involved, uh, Ukrainians who are having their country invaded and also Russians who are involved in it. Also, it's a terrible situation. And it's an incredibly complex situation. And, um, you know, ultimately, I think as, as uh, spiritual leaders, we should be calling people to prayer and to uh, advocate for peace. Um, I think we agree about that, don't we, Tom? Yeah, absolutely. For sure, for sure. OK, cool. That was a good conversation. And, you know, please, um, you know, do. I'm sure people feel strongly about this. So if, if you want to write in and give us feedback or um, do it on social media, please do reverendpod at gmail.com. Uh, we just got a final email from our Canadian correspondent. Um, I just wanted to read this out because I think it's important not to forget this story, um, you know, what just because of the stuff that's been happening with, with Ukraine. Um, so this is from our Canadian correspondent uh, responding to, it's basically about the end of the trucker convoy. So you know that uh, Trudeau invoked the Emergencies Act. He sent in militarized pol- police into the um, protest and he um, basically managed to break it up. Um, so then he subsequently has revoked the emergencies app, which was an, um, slight, somewhat unexpected. And this is what this email is largely about. So uh, dear Revs, Jamie, Tom and Daniel, praise God that Trudeau has now revoked the emergencies act. I truthfully did not foresee that at the start of Thursday, I have to humble myself before God and remember that his justice comes not only through human agents, but also, and so much more so by his hand. A clear, wonderful national scale event that signals how in moments clouded by our despair, God can always make things work towards his good. What happened? Obviously, we cannot judge or know Justin's heart and motivations. That's Trudeau, not Welby. Uh, some senators, are equivalent to the House of Lords, have indicted, oh, sorry, indi- indicated that as debate continues over the Emergencies Act in the Senate, it became clear yesterday afternoon that the Act wasn't going to pass the Senate, uh, even though it had passed the House of Commons on Monday. So did a Canadian institution finally do something to check government overreach? If this is the case, amazing. If we count the parliamentary sitting days, it appears also that if debate had continued in the Senate, then the Act would automatically have been revoked since the Emergencies Act had to be ratified within seven sitting days after being invoked. Whatever the reason, it's clear that Trudeau has been playing awful games with the rule of law and the parliamentary processes, but that he also saw the writing on the wall. 
So even though new grim events grip our world with the threat of large scale war, I'm happy remembering God's ability to work his good. And I'm grateful that Canada has perhaps escaped the hard fisted side of tyranny. There is still work to be done in Canada. All the mandates need to go and we need to destroy the digital ID systems. Truckers have lost licenses. All the bank accounts need to be unfrozen. Some have started to be. Trust in institutions have declined sharply. Political prisoners remain in jail without bail. The use of financial methods for control has been tried and appears largely to have succeeded in Canada. A trial run for social credit going forward? Question mark. But we must thank God that Trudeau's power grab has been checked. I must always be grateful and ever more trusting in the Lord. Thanks for reading my emails these past several weeks. A remarkable period in Canada's history. I think I will cap off my correspondence on this front for now. I look forward to continuing to listening to your wonderful conversations and to taking part in a small way again in the future. I give thanks to our righteous God and I continue to pray for justice, peace and the leaders of this fallen world. Best wishes. So there we are, chaps. The good That's, news. There's, well, so to, I mean, it's sort of, yeah, to, to an extent, isn't it? I suppose it's good that the Emergency Act has been dropped, but at the same time, you've still got truckers who have, you know, lost their licenses, had their trucks impounded and, you know, worrying stuff around digital ID and all that kind of stuff. So, but yeah, okay. I think we should leave it there. I think we've we've gone we've gone round we've gone round the the salient issues. Um, chaps, uh, thanks so much for your time as always. Oh, should we say a prayer to finish or a blessing? Who wants to do it? Yeah. I'm happy to. Go on then, Tom. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, in this fallen world, we pray for your peace to be revealed. We pray that the situation in Ukraine is resolved that there is a cease to violence that the um, the Russians will realize that seeking these things through violent means is, is not right and that Putin will pull back we pray that there will be a ceasefire we pray for all those who are mourning lost ones all those who have lost family for all those who have lost friends for those who are displaced without livelihoods, for all the evils of war. We ask for your peace and mercy. Uh, this Ash Wednesday, we pray that we remember that we are fallen, and that we rely on your grace. So flood this world with your grace. Bring peace where there is war. Turn the hearts of evil men. Finally, we give thanks that in Canada, the repression has lessened. We pray for future liberty, trust, and love in the name of Jesus Christ. We also ask for your blessings upon all who listen to this podcast. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks to everyone who's watched and listened to this program. And we look forward to being with you again next time. Until then, God bless.